Okay, good afternoon. Good to see everyone. Uh, before we get started, I would like to say uh, congratulations to Luke Hochaver and the Kansas City Royals for winning the World Series championship. I believe he was the winning pitcher, and I'm a big, big baseball fan, and uh, so I'd like to say congratulations to him on being a world champion today. Uh, going back, revisiting Saturday night, then moving on to the next challenge, I thought we really played complimentary football. I thought uh, all three phases really, really complemented each other. We were able to generate explosive plays in a number of areas. We were able to control the field position. Uh, third downs, I thought, uh, you know, in terms of situational football, we did a good job there prior to, to running the clock out in the fourth quarter. We were 9 out of 14 offensively on third down conversions. And then defensively, we were able to get off the field as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, the other thing I thought is Kentucky was a, a big play offense, a quick strike offense, and you take away the one big play uh, that they had, uh, we really limited the momentum plays. And when you go on the road, one of the key factors of being able to win on the road is to eliminate momentum plays and not let the crowd get into it. And I thought our players had a great approach, a great business-like approach. Uh, so now it's it's what we do with that moving forward to the next challenge. South Carolina comes in here, a very, very hungry football team. Coach Elliott has done a great job of really infusing energy, uh, excitement. Uh, they're playing loose, uh, and you can see it. They're a hungry football team. We all know what Farrah Cooper brings to the table. He's one of the most dynamic and explosive players, uh, not only in our conference, but in the entire country. Uh, defensively uh, with Coach Hoke. Uh, you know, you see some different things schematically. Uh, they're playing with a high level of, of energy again. Uh, big, big physical up front. Uh, had the luxury of playing man-to-man -man in the back end. Uh, so it's going to be a great challenge for our football team this week to continue to prepare and continue to improve. We're not anywhere where we need to be in terms of a finished product. As you know, when you watch the video, it's never as good as it seems. It's never as bad as it seems. And we have to continue to focus on the small details, uh, you know, from our fundamentals to doing things right in different situations. Uh, but again, looking forward to going back to practice today. So I'll answer any questions. Uh, Coach, you talk about uh, how invaluable in-game repetitions are. Um, when you have a big lead on a team, how do you go about making the decision of when to put in the backup yeah. quarterback and, and what to do with him? Do you let him run the offense as normal? There was 36 seconds left in the third quarter, up 52-21, and Dobbs played two more series. So what goes into that decision? Well, there's a lot that goes into it, and that's something, you know, the flavor of the game, the feel for the game. But also, if you look at the comebacks in all of college football, not this this just this year but throughout you know the last few years uh, as a head coach and you're responsible for everything you never feel comfortable uh, until the clock runs out and you never assume anything and it's a fine line but we have confidence you know in the players that went in there we have tremendous confidence in Quentin Dormady he continues to get better uh, but again it's just it's a feel thing uh, but you never feel comfortable uh, when you're responsible for everything and you just have to look at college football and the amount of comebacks that come back, and especially when you're playing a team like Kentucky that's a quick strike offense that has the athletes they can score at any given time. Uh, you know, you never take anything for granted. What's the difference you've seen in your pass rush, particularly defensive line, Vereen and Barnett, these last few games, and just – how much of an adjustment process was there for those guys after Kirk got hit, got hurt, just in terms of growing from that? Anytime you don't have Kirk Majid on the field for you, you know, it really it hurts you because he meant so much to us. I think our players played off of his energy. They played off of his leadership. What I see is, is a transformational change that's occurring in terms of leadership. We have other individuals stepping up, and to Kurt Majid's credit, he's actually mentoring and guiding some individuals and he's kind of force feeding them. You know, it's like, you know, we had a little uh, side friendly bet about making Jalen Reeves Maven stand up and talk to the team. Uh, and then we critiqued them uh, right in front of them. And again, it's just part of that evolution of leadership where Kurt has done a good job of almost now kind of behind the scenes type leadership.
uh, which has been great to see. Uh, but any time, you know, you don't have him, uh, it hurts you not only on the field but off the field. But, you know, it's those individuals stepping up, you know, you know Corey Vereen, uh, Derek Barnett, they have great pride in their performance. I think they're, they're getting off on the football, uh, their stance and starts, the ability to reduce their surface, use their hands, and we've generated third and long situations. And there isn't a lot of mystery when you get into third and long situations, when you get into anywhere from third to, you know, third and short to third and four to six, there's a little bit of mystery uh, behind the play calling. But when you get third and long situations, you may get a draw, you may get screens or drop back pass. So I think that's really aided them too, uh, being ahead of the sticks defensively as well. Butch, last week you were asked about Evan Berry, if he was one of the best uh, kick returners that you had ever coached, and you mentioned Antonio Brown. I'm wondering now if you're ready to say that maybe he's eclipsing Antonio Brown. Well, he's getting close, and he has a great drive to be the best, and, you know, can't say enough for him and the, the, what he brings. And, you know, special teams is either the first play of offense or the first play of defense, but also – I think, and in, in Evan would be the first to tell you as well, it's the other 10 individuals on the football field. They're taking great pride in their performance. Uh, they're taking great pride in their fundamentals. Uh, we work it every single day, and they have great expectations, and they have great confidence, and they're doing a great job with that. Now, obviously, you know, being a great returner is a skill set. You have to have great instincts. But also, uh, whether it's Cam, whether it's Elvin, whether it's Evan, I think they'd be the first to tell you that they couldn't do it by themselves. And those other 10 individuals are doing a great job as well. Butch, what have you seen from them specifically on film um, since that change? Sometimes a team just needs a new voice, I think was the, the reason for the coaching change there. What have you seen from them before coaching change and after? Well, they're running the same thing schematically. And, and Coach Spurrier is a legend. He's done a great job. But I think Coach Elliott has come in and just given them, you know, a change, giving them some energy, uh, probably not worried about making mistakes. I've tried to kind of put myself in their frame of mind of how would you handle it. And I think the coaching staff has done a great job of really handling probably a very, very difficult situation. And Coach Spurrier is one of the best coaches to have ever coached the game of football. Uh, but I think they've done a great job with that. And I think their players have responded. Uh, you know, they're playing with, with great effort. They're playing with great pride. They're playing with intensity, and you can see that. Butch, uh, talk, what did you see out of Micah Abernathy when you went back and looked at the film there in the nickel spot? Will that be an open competition this week? And then if Jay Sean can't go, how do, how do you balance between either Matt Crowder or Jack Jones? Well, first of all, Micah Abernathy is one of those freshmen that – has continued to get better and better and better. And you can see it in his style of play. You can really see it in his overall playing speed. It's amazing. You know, we always talk about not letting the, the mind tie the feet up. And he's becoming more and more comfortable. He's playing at a much more higher uh, speed level and been really, really proud of him and his continued growth and development. So just like every week, he will compete again uh, with Malik for the nickel spot. And we'll see how that goes. But uh, Micah has gained valuable game experience, and you can see him now starting to play a lot quicker. He's more decisive in his decisions. And, you know, he, he had two critical blocks on Evan Berry's kickoff return where he had great judgment. And Micah's a smart player, but he had great judgment on who to block. And as the off returner, you have to rely on your instincts and your judgment because you don't have a particular person to block. And you have to make full speed decisions. And he made two full speed decisions that really allowed Evan to get to the end zone. So we will compete for that spot just like every week, but I think he's getting better and better. In terms of the offensive line situation, we'll know more about Jay Sean. It's no worse than what it's been in the past is with, with his ankle. So we anticipate him uh, being probable and being ready to go. And that's a tribute to him. Uh, we thought Matt Crowder did some really good things for us 
uh, at the left guard position. And then when Jack went in there, Jack did some good things at the right guard position too. And the other individual who has just been a flat out warrior for us, who uh, gives tremendous effort, he's playing his best football, he's given everything that he has is Dylan Wiseman. Uh, I thought Dylan played exceptionally hard, played very, very well uh, Saturday night. And uh, we really like his style of play. But we thought Mac performed very well. We thought Jack did some good things when he was in there as well. So it makes for a great week of competition and a great luxury for us right now because, you know, that is a position that's kind of been inundated a little bit with injuries, just like our defensive line. Butch, I have two questions. First off, on the Emmanuel Mosley targeting, yep. did he play that the way he is coached to play that? He played it about as well as you could possibly play it. If 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 there was a coaching point, you would tell him to, to wrap up, uh, to try to wrap. But, you know, he hit below. Uh, he hit with his shoulder pad, did not lead with his helmet. Uh, so the one coaching point would be to wrap, not just, uh, you know, that would be the big thing. But he did not launch himself into the defender. And a follow-up on that, I'm sure you've talked to the SEC office. If they – what explanation did you get from them? Well, you know, again, some things are, are with p privacy, uh, you know, but we did have dialogue. Uh, right now we're, we're trying to figure out. I don't believe there is an appeal process, but we're trying to do anything and everything. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's a decision that, that they made, and you have to respect that decision and move on. And, you know, the SEC has done a great job of getting immediate feedback to us and responding and, you know, they, they've done a great job in, in that regard. So I'll know a little bit more as the week progresses uh, with that. And that's really all I can say. Coach, you kind of touched on this earlier with the defensive line question. But do you feel like your defense has been more aggressive lately? It seems like they've impacted the quarterback more. And what do you attribute that yeah. to? We, ha we have impacted the quarterback a little bit more. And I think it comes down to when Steve brought up the play at the defensive end positions. Uh, you know, and then we still need to continue to get more push internally from the defensive tackle position. Uh, but we're using our hands better. We're, we're getting off. We're staying ahead of the chains. Uh, when we bring some five-man pressures, uh, we're able to get home. You know, we had one instance uh, on a big play given up that we weren't able to get home on. Um, and we gave up a big play in that. But I just think their overall relentless approach has really helped. Which was just curious if you had a – we haven't asked about Jason Crum in a while. How's yeah. his recovery coming along? And I guess Kurt for that matter and uh, Marquez North as well. Yep. Marquez North, uh, just a game time decision. He couldn't go. Uh, he practiced all week, you know, just store, sore and stiff. And we're going to do some different things uh, this week with him to try to get him ready to go because we need him. You know, what we're asking our receiver core to do right now, I don't think there's another school in the country that's – asking as much of a group as we are in terms of lack of numbers. Um, you know, and you look at the game that Josh Malone had and Josh Smith is given everything that he has. I thought Von Pearson played maybe his best football game of the year last last week. Uh, so we're going to need these individuals in, in moving forward. Jonathan Johnson, we're moving all around. You know, Jawan Jennings continues to improve and get better and better and better. And, you know, all that entire receiving core has, has done a good job and it's really a lack of numbers, and we have to recruit, and we have to continue to develop. But that's kind of Marquez's situation. Uh, Kurt Majit, I believe, has an MRI uh, at the end of, end of this week, so we'll know a little bit more in terms of, of where he's at and if there is a timetable for him to be back. Uh, so I'll know a little bit more uh, later in the week how that progresses. Uh, Jason Kroom, uh, I'll know a little bit more today in terms of his status. I would say he's still uh, probably doubtful for this game. And it, with, 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 with Jay Sean, how much is that, I guess, injury maybe hurting his development a little bit or just because obviously he's a, a kid with, the break, with, with a great future in front of him. Yeah. It looks like it's been a frustration. Well, I give Jay Sean Robertson a lot of credit. He's battled through this. He's maintained a great positive attitude. He's a great character individual. His mom has done a tremendous job with him. Uh, just can't say enough about him. Uh, he's battled and battled and battled. It's the same nagging injury. Uh, unfortunately, wrong place, wrong time gets gets you know landed on it again. 
uh, but it's no worse than where it was, and he'll do his due diligence. And you talk about development, you need to practice, and his practice time has been limited because of the injuries. But to his credit, uh, when he's played, he's played well. And I can't wait to get a healthy Jay Sean Robertson back because the sky's the limit for him. But you talked about the guard situation moving forward. I guess Jack had played, looked like he played pretty well against George and Alabama. I guess what went into the decision to go with Mac when, when Jay Sean went down on the first try? Well, again, it's just the overall development. It's your practice and, you know, it's it's the grading of the games and it's nothing against Jack. Jack is, has done a good job, but you guys don't see what we see uh, every day. And Jack's a good football player, and Jack's going to be a great player. And I love him to death, and he understands the things he needs to work on. Sometimes it's just from a strength standpoint of being a true freshman, you know, and Mac has the experience. Mac has done some good things and performed very well when he's gone in there. But, again, it's good to have the luxury of being able to play some of those individuals. Butch, do you think it takes time for coaches when they come into a new situation to kind of feel out what they have in terms of players? And I guess specifically, did, did it take some time for Mike to kind of understand what Dobbs' skill set is, what he can do, and, and, and how to coach him and, and to result in the play calling we've kind of seen these last couple of weeks? The, the play calling hasn't changed. Uh, the execution has changed. Our players are executing right now at a high level, but – the, the play calling's been there all year, and Mike DeBoard is an experienced veteran that has coached at all levels. And I do think it's it's more learning um, your players and their skill sets, but that occurred at a relatively early stage when he came in here. So, uh, and I think it's the players earning trust in terms of you know who to throw the ball to, what plays to call in critical situations, and vice versa. Uh, but you know, the play calling really hasn't changed. Our, our players right now are playing with a lot of confidence. Uh, they're executing, and we're staying ahead of the chains, and that's that really, really helps as well. Uh, but, again, this week we'll be challenged with a very good South Carolina defense and a good football team coming in here. Coach, I wanted to ask a little bit more about uh, the blocking on the return game, basically. You, yeah. you talked about just fundamentally. What's working well fundamentally? What are these guys doing really well? And is there anybody in particular that's been exceptional just in terms of blocking and setting up these returns? Well, I think it's just the skill set. It, you know, for instance, when you take about blocking on a kickoff return, it's the hardest skill set in all of football. If you look at a frontline player, he's got to drop full speed 30 to 35 yards and run at an angle and sometimes turn his back to the individual that he has to block who has 30 to 35 yards of a running full start ahead of them. And then you got to come speed to power and you got to block him. It's almost the equivalent of blocking uh, a runaway refrigerator coming down a hill. So there's technique that goes involved in it in terms of bracing yourself, speed to power, understanding leverage, and then you know, running the outside number and ripping and running. And it's a skill set that we practice every day. And our players have done a very, very good job of that. Same thing on, on uh, you know, punt return. You know, you have to win at the line of scrimmage. You have to get in return phase. You got to understand all the different techniques that are involved in it. There's so much technique it, work that goes into playing winning special teams. It's all technique oriented and it's a want to. And it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one matchup. And that's what I love about special teams is they're one-on-one -on -one matchups. It's me against you. And it's taking pride in winning your one-on-one -on -one matchups. And we actually list that. You know, we list their win-loss record. They understand that. And our players have done a very, very good job with that. Um, there's probably so many players uh, I would be remiss if I, I miss some of them because they're, they're given everything. I talked about Micah. You know, as the off returner, Cortez McDowell has been a staple for us on special teams. You look at some of the youngsters, Austin Smith, John Kelly, you know, these are all freshmen on there. And, you know, you look at Gavin Bryant. Gavin Bryant has finally found a role on his football team, and he's helping us win. And then you have individuals like Justin Martin, who's not only – playing corner now, but he's on special teams. We all know about Juwan Jennings. Juwan Jennings possesses uh, great instincts to get to the football. Some of the things he does on our kickoff team, our kickoff cover team is remarkable just because he understands how to set players up. He understands how to leverage the football. He has a re relentless approach. So, you know, everyone on those teams are doing a great job with that. And they take pride in their performance. That's probably the biggest thing 
is understanding your role and taking great pride in understanding your role. Justin Martin and Emmanuel Mosley have kind of rotated at the outside corner with Mosley being out for the first half. Do you just let Justin play out there or do you try to find another guy to rotate in with him? It's kind of, it is what it is. There's no waiver wires in college football. We're, we're uh, really down at the corner position. Uh, we lack a lot of depth there and our players have done a great job with it. And just like at the receiver position, our corners have been warriors all, all year long. So, you know, Justin's been a warrior. Justin's been nicked up and, you know, through some injuries that started in training camp and it's great to have him back healthy now. But, you know, from him playing corner, from him being on special teams, you know, a lot of these individuals, they've done a great job. Coach, I know you spent some time with him a couple years ago in Bristol, but what's your reaction to Frank Beamer stepping down, and what's your relationship like nowadays with Whit Babcock? Well, I've enjoyed uh, really building a great relationship with Coach Beamer. And as a coach in this profession and growing up in this profession, you try to you know, research and find out about individuals and, and successful individuals. And Frank Beamer was at the top of my list. Uh, he's one that uh, I really researched. Uh, and tried to spend a lot of time with that. And then uh, I, I want to say it was our last year at Cincinnati. We played Virginia Tech uh, in Washington, D.C., and had a time uh, a little bit to really get to know him. And then probably one of the greatest thrills I've had uh, in all of coaching is he came out with a book, and he mentioned uh, myself and our football team in his book uh, when we played them. And he autographed it to me and he said, uh, Butch, I meant what I said in this book, good luck at Tennessee. And that's something that I have sitting on my desk right now. And uh, so I have tremendous amount of respect. It's, it's very unfortunate because, uh, you know, college football is, leaving, is losing one of the greatest individuals of all time and one of the greatest coaches of all time. And uh, it shows too, when you give a coach longevity and you give a, a coach an opportunity to really instill his program. And we live in an instant gratification society where everyone wants things now. But if you really want to build something special, uh, you give a coach an opportunity in a long period of time and you see what happens. And Virginia Tech is like that. In terms of my relationship with Whit Babcock, you know, we, we worked together at West Virginia. Uh, he was the athletic director uh, when he got hired when I was at Cincinnati. He's a good friend of mine, and I know he'll do a good job there in finding a, a replacement for Coach Beamer. But uh, Josh Dobbs breaks an awful lot of tackles. Is he more elusive, or, or is, it, is he stronger than he looks? Why do you think it is that he's able to break so many tackles? Good question. Uh, I think, first of all, he has very good instincts. Uh, He's able to, to make individuals miss. He understands how to set them up. I think he runs hard. I think he runs strong. Uh, but I think a lot of it is instincts, and he's done a real good job with that. But you guys have 25 offensive plays of 25 yards or more. I think 11 rushes of 25 yards or more. You've talked all season about the need for more splash plays. What's your team goal for, for those number of plays, and how close are you to being there to be a, quote, explosive okay. offense? We don't have a goal. Uh, we just understand we need to have big explosive plays. Our goal is to create one-on-one -on -one matchups and then let recruiting take over, and it's me against you. And our players have done a good job uh, with that. It was finally great to get Jalen in the open field on a screen pass. Uh, you can see what he can do when he gets some open space. Obviously, Elvin's done a great job. And then, you know, finally getting the deep ball going with Josh Malone. I thought Josh went up and really played the ball well in the air and then finished the run after the catch. And, you know, that's just being rewarded for your hard work. Josh Malone comes out every single day and works exceptionally hard. And when we talk about the amount of the volume of repetitions that we're asking of our wide receivers, Josh is up there with the repetitions all year. He hasn't missed one rep of practice all year. Uh, he's there every day and he has that internal drive, drive to be great and you can see just the maturation and the progression from year one to year two and we talk about it every single day with him but you know we don't set specific goals and we need X amount of big splash plays. 
we just we need momentum plays. And now on our call sheet, we have a, a, a special category for momentum plays and things that we need to call. Thanks, Coach. Have a good day.